I'm running for governor to go to work for the 99 percent of us, the working class and middle class people who are overtaxed, underserved, and underpaid under a government that's been bought by the richest 1 percent with their big campaign contributions. I'm calling for a Green New Deal for New York. It would guarantee everybody the right to a useful job, a living wage, affordable health care, affordable housing, and a good education. And the centerpiece of the Green New Deal is to fight climate change by banning fracking and moving to 100 percent clean energy over the next 15 years. That was the Green Party's Howie Hawkins digging in his heels in this week's debate in the race for governor. Hawkins took to the stage alongside, of course, Governor Cuomo and Republican Rob Astorino answering questions surrounding, as you heard there, fracking, same-sex marriage, the economy, and a host of other issues. The latest Q poll, sh Q poll excuse me, shows that Governor Cuomo has a 20-point lead over Astorino, but Mr. Hawkins here is approaching double digits, currently sitting at 9% in the race. And he's been endorsed by a number of organizations, including, as you'd expect, the Green Party of New York State and the New Progressive Alliance. Hawkins was also New York's Green Party candidate for U.S. Senate in 2006. And he's kind of joined Dominic and I now on the set. Howie, thank you very much. Um, it's an overused question, but I'm curious your answer. Why do it? Well, why is Rob Astorino running? He's 20 points behind. Why is uh, Cuomo, at least, he's not saying it, but why is he running for president if he can't win? I mean, given the problems he's got here in New York State. You know, the, politics is not one event. It's a process. It's part of raising issues and getting people organized around them. You know, I ran, <coughs> excuse me, in 2010, and we got a ballot line. Uh, and then we got 1.3%. Now we got 9% in the last two polls. So we're climbing the ladder. And uh, so it's a process, not one event. That's why I'm running. I guess the question is, between then and now, you go from under 2% to approaching 10%. Uh, is this the teach-out factor that people, obviously, as we saw in the primary, a lot of progressives showed dissatisfaction with the current governor, so they're voting for someone else, arguably a protest vote, or is it something different that we're not putting our finger on? Why are you getting as much of the electorate if you believe the polls as you are? I think Cuomo's got a record now, and a lot of people don't like it. I think uh, he, he says he's giving property tax relief, but the average relief is $34 per homeowner, and it's temporary. Um, I'm calling for uh, real property uh, tax reform by restoring the revenue sharing we had in the 1970s, which would be about eight times what we have right now, and then local communities could lower their property taxes back down again because the state would be paying for its mandates. The school issue is huge. Between the underfunding in upstate rural and inner city communities, and everybody across the board, including the suburbs, upset with the high stakes testing aligned with Common Core. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't like his educational policy. And then on fracking and our energy future, he's been sitting on the fence. And he said in the debate the other day, the health impacts analysis that we've been waiting for will come after the election but before the end of the year. And, you know, I've been saying all along, if he had wanted to ban fracking and commit to 100% clean energy, he would have done it by now. It's very convenient for him to have that study come in and make his decision because I think what he'll do is what he did with the trial balloon a couple years ago and, and make the southern tier the sacrifice zone and we'll, we'll get locked into natural gas. But he wants that as far back in the rearview mirror for the next time he runs for office because that decision won't be popular with the voters and maybe with the oil and gas industry but not the voters. You and Mr. Cuomo are playing for the same base. Are you, are you, uh, or are you concerned, or is it possible that you might be a spoiler in this election? I know he has a large lead, but you're cutting into his same Democratic base. Well, the way I look at it, there are two Republicans in this race. The rich Republicans are back in Cuomo. 331 people gave him $22 million, huge donations. All the prominent Republicans, Alphonse D'Amato, Ken Langone from Home Depot, Castamatitis, the Republican down there in the city that ran for mayor. They're all back in Cuomo, so I'm not worried about spoiling the election. And the other thing is, I think a lot of the Democratic base, they're old New Deal Democrats. They want a living wage, a useful job, health care, housing, and a good education. Those are the things that the New Deal talked about providing to people. And since the 70s, and that Cuomo epitomizes it, they're no longer New Deal Democrats, they're corporate New Democrats. And I think a lot of the rank-and-file Democrats are beginning to see that. And, and we think we can appeal to those people. We don't take corporate money. That's one of our principles. We want to be based on small contributions from the people. How would you respond if somebody said, hey, what you're talking about is wealth redistribution here? Um, would you say absolutely or say no? That's a convenient stereotype. Uh, we want working people to get the fru full fruit of their labor. 
And what we have now is a tax system that redistributes wealth upward. They give corporate welfare tax breaks to politically connected donors, and it's supposed to trickle down, but it doesn't, not to the working people and the small businesses. So, yeah, we're about a fair, fairer distribution of wealth, income, and power. And uh, what we got now is a system that's concentrating it at the top. Since the Great Recession, all the growth in the economy has gone to the top mm -hmm. 1%. Realistically, how do you define success? I mean, no offense, but you, you're not going to win the governor's race. So, and polling indicates that. So is it, is it just maintaining the, the ballot line? What's success in your own words? Well, I'm not conceding the election yet. They still <laughs> got to vote. But I think uh, we started out saying, you know, 5% was within our reach. That would tie basically the best ever for an independent progressive third party candidate in New York history. And that would give us, you know, that would mean something and would give us some, a calling card to go out and organize people and talk to the media. We're at about double of that. That will be an historic vote. It will say something about the political system. And, you know, if our next goal is to, the next step on the ladder is 10% double digits, row C on the ballot. And I think then we're the third party in New York politics. We, we got the ballot line, unlike the other ballot line parties, by running our own candidate. You know, all the others that have a ballot line did it by getting on the coattails of a major party yep. candidate. So I think, you know, that gives us uh, a, a standing in the political system and, and going forward, uh, you know, we're going to be part of the conversation. You know, four years ago, um, I remember sitting at this table and there was just this palpable sense of frustration for the New York electorate at the end of the Patterson term that it was kind of like Washington. Stuff never got done in Albany. There'd just be this intractable thing where you had the Senate Republicans, Democrat Assembly, and a governor who kind of, you know, depending on how the wind was blowing, would go either way, but it didn't get done. Cuomo four years later says, love me or hate me, right? I passed through a lot of progressive social issues, and I took a moderate position on economics. Now, some people would say he took a conservative position, including a lot of guests we have here on the program. That being said, is there an argument to say that the art of the deal or the art of compromise is sometimes better than even just unwavering principle if nothing gets done? We get budgets. You know the argument, right? Yeah, I know the argument. I mean, getting budgets in on time is a pretty low bar. And yes, we've had them since Cuomo was in there. I mean, it's four men in a room, they cut a deal, and then the legislature rubber stamps it. I think you need to open up the process, bring it back in front of the legislature. You'll get a better product. And uh, the product we've got now, it's we ha we're at the lowest level of school funding in 65 years. Now, Cuomo will say we spend more per capita than any state in the nation. Well, we got high cost of living down here in Westchester, New York, and mm -hmm. Long Island. That brings it up. But we have the seventh worst distribution. So like my school district in Syracuse, we lost a quarter of our staff in the last four years. We got a graduation rate of about 50%. And you can't tell me you're going to improve that by qu cutting out a quarter of our staff and all the programs that go with it. So. See what happened when you left Syracuse? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I went to school in Syracuse. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, obviously, you're resonating uh, with part of the electorate. Is there a hope that you have that if Dominic's right and the polls are right, that after the election you don't win, there's a message of some kind after the primary with Teachout's uh, showing and then your showing if the numbers hold up here or you even gain a little bit more, that it'll have a more progressive economic agenda? I'm talking about the governor, of course, in the next four years. Well, I think the impact will be in the legislature. We have legislation on minimum wage, single-payer health care. A majority of the assembly people are co-sponsors. About a third of the Senate supports it. We have hearings coming up in November and December. You know, we get a strong vote following up on the progressive vote in the Democratic primaries. Those legislators who may be wavering, wondering what they should do, they're going to say, I better get on board this train because somebody can run against me in two years if I'm not for single-payer, too. And, you know, the Greens will be out there speaking along with everybody in that movement. Um, and the issue of fracking is huge. Mm. I mean, that's really a fork in the road for us. We go fracking, we're building a fossil fuel infrastructure, locks us in for decades. We fail to address climate change, which is huge. And we are technologically backward when we should be going into the 21st century with this distributed renewable energy mm. smart grid and the lower electric costs. Western Europe's investing in it. We're going to be backward I, in I economics. I mean, I'm curious. If I just looked and I laid down their politics side by side, Bill de Blasio is closer to Mr. Hawkins than he is to Mr. Cuomo. I understand politically why the governor and the mayor are on the same page here. We're big boys. We get it. But was there ever conversations or even remotely close conversations where the mayor said, you know, I'll stand with you? No. My uh, running mate in 2010, Gloria Matera, ran against de Blasio twice for city council and ran then for borough 
uh, president in Brooklyn. It was all over Atlantic Yards. Yeah. I mean, de Blasio's money back in his real estate. And, you know, we want a government that represents the people, not the developers, not Wall Street, not the big uh, industries in the state. So uh, that uh, conversation never happened. Mm. There is an event tomorrow uh, commemorating an acorn organizer that I heard de Blasio was going to be at, and some people are suggesting I should go there. Um, I did see him when I was walking in Park Slope uh, early in the spring. He, I was going a corner like this, he was going a corner like that. And I was with Gloria Matera, but yeah. we didn't talk. Shocker. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I wish you the best of luck here. Right. And I, I know about you, I, I love campaigns that are always about something, you know, and they legitimately care. So even for cynics like us, we still have to be convinced <laughs> otherwise. Best of luck to you All in right, a week and a half. You. All right, coming up next, everyone. Author James McManus speaks to RFL about his new novel, which focuses on one of America's unsung heroes who came to FDR's aid during World War II. We'll have that conversation after this.